Okay, well, we'll make a start to the meeting, please. Uh, can everybody hear me okay with the microphones? Very well. Yeah. Good. Uh, welcome. Uh, just before we start the meeting uh, proper, uh, I'd just like to say a few words about the arrangements that we've made uh, for this meeting, which is in response to some comments we had about some of the arrangements we had for previous meetings, and particularly the last one, which was at the UCLAN uh, Centre in, in Preston, where uh, the sound was not very good. Uh, the way in which we laid out the room wasn't very good for members of the public to see who was speaking, uh, things about car parking, public transport, and so on. Uh, so we've done our best this time to try and arrange things so that it's convenient for members of the public to properly engage uh, with the meeting, although this is not a public meeting as such, it's a, it's a joint meeting of the CCGs, which happens to take place in public. So there is a difference. There'll be many other public meetings where people uh, can come along and talk about specific issues, which is part of the engagement process. But this is a meeting of the CCGs, a business meeting in public, but hopefully in order to help people better understand the, uh, what goes on at the meeting, in particular on this uh, agenda, we had a pre-meeting, and I think most of the members of the public who were uh, or are here now were at that pre-meeting, where uh, Andrew and myself, Amanda would normally be there, Amanda Doyle, who's the most uh, senior officer for the programme, uh, but was delayed uh, today. Uh, we will intend to do that in future, but we'll listen to any feedback about how we can do things better, both in relation to that and generally. Uh, but the purpose of that uh, session earlier was to explain what is on the agenda, uh, and so as we go through the meeting, hopefully, uh, members of the public can better understand what is being said and so on. So uh, that's what we've tried to do. We welcome any feed. We've already had some feedback from the meeting, which we will uh, take into account, uh, like questions put to us in advance. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, members of the public will feel uh, better able to understand the, what is going on. We will still, at the end of the meeting, have a very short period for questions that relate to the agenda, and if there are any issues that we can't deal with then, either through time or through detail, we will make sure that the appropriate uh, members of the organisation are contacted, uh, contacted the members of the public involved and give them answers to the uh, questions. So I hope that's clear, both for members of the public and colleagues around the table. Uh, so uh, we'll now move on to the meeting proper. Uh, welcome and introductions. Uh, I think probably I've welcomed you. Uh, I am Phil Watson. I'm the independent chair of the committee. We'll perhaps go around very quickly. There are a lot of people here, but if we could very quickly say who we are. I know there are signs in front of people, but you might not be able to read them. So we'll go around that way. It also allows us to practice using the microphones, doesn't it? So I'm Andrew Bennett. I'm exec director for commissioning, uh, working across Lancashire and South Cumbria. I'm Gaynor Jones, I'm the PA to Andrew Bennett and Gary Raphael. Hello, Dennis Rutsi, Chief Officer of the CCGs in Central Lancashire. Hello, I'm Elaine Johnston. I am here today in my capacity as Chair of the Commissioning Policy and Implementation Group to present item six. Um, Rebecca Higgs, I'm the IFR Policy Development uh, Manager at the Commissioning Support Unit. My name's Neil Greaves. I'm the Commons and Engagement Lead for Healthier Lancashire and South Cumbria. Well, I'm your Chair Charlie South for Bull CCG. Um, my name's Penny Morris and I'm Clinical Officer at Blackburn with Darwin CCG. I'm Richard Robinson. I'm a GP. I'm Chair of East Lancashire CCG. I'm Graham Burgess. I'm Chair of Blackburn with Darwin CCG. Good afternoon, I'm Roy Fisher, Chair of Blackpool CCG. Good afternoon, my name is Andy Curran, I'm Medical Director for the ICS. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Marcus Stafferty, I lead on staff engagement for Lancashire and South Cumbria. Hello, my name is Carl Ashworth, I work for, for the Midlands and Lancashire Commissioning Support Unit, I'm supporting the ICS as a Strategy and Policy Director.
Joa, and I'm a GP and the Vice Chair for File and Wire CCG. Hello, I'm Mary Dowling, I'm Chair of File and Wire CCG. Hi, I'm Lawrence Conway, Chief Executive of South Lakeland District Council, representing also Barrow and Lancaster City Councils. Good afternoon, I'm Jay Hawker, Chief Officer at Morecambe Bay CCG. Hi, I'm Doug Soper, a lay member at West Lancashire CCG. Hi, Debbie Cork, and I'm a lay member at Greater Preston CCG. Uh, Mitchell Gard from Freshwater, supporting the comms and engagement operation across the ICS. Um, Gary Raphael, finance lead for the ICS, and I regret I've uh, forgot to pick my uh, badge up on the table. Uh, David Bonson, I'm Chief Operating Officer for, for Blackpool CCG. Harry Catherall, Chief Executive of Blackwood Island Borough Council, looking at how <coughs> we integrate uh, local authority services with NHS services. <coughs> uh, Clive Unit, lay member for Morecambe Bay CCG. Good afternoon, I'm Samantha Mukherjee, I'm Chair of Greater Preston CCG. Um, I'm Amanda Doyle, I'm Chief Officer for the Far Coast CCGs and I'm Chief Officer for <coughs> Healthier Lancashire and South Cumbria. Thank you. Um, it, we have a, a colleague over there called Mike, who's in charge of the microphones, aptly named, but also you might have noticed in the middle there's a camera, and uh, this will be uh, available on YouTube, I think, following on from the meeting. So anybody who's not here, you can tell colleagues uh, if they've nothing better to do. They have several hours to uh, watch uh, us uh, perform our meeting. So uh, there we are. Thank you. Uh, I have received apologies from uh, Catherine uh, Fairclough, Jane Cass... <coughs> Jeff Jolliffe, Dean Langton, Alan Oldfield, Angie Rid uh, Ridgewell, uh, Rachel Snow Miller, Louise Taylor, Yassine uh, Yassin Talib, Paul Kenyon, uh, and also from Sir Bill Taylor. Are there any other apologies that have not been listed that we're aware of? Nope. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I, as usual, ask for any declarations of interest anybody wishes to make about any items which are on the agenda either now or, if it occurs to you during the meeting, please do so then. Any at this point? Thank you. Uh, any others? Okay. So we'll move on to item three, which is, uh, sorry, item four, which are minutes of the two uh, public meetings. First of all, the fifth, the, there is the 5th of July and the 7th of June. So uh, we'll deal with the 5th of July first. Uh, I'll read the pages out uh, for people to make any comments or alterations. Page one. This is, the, this is the 5th of July, first of all, I should say again. Page one, page two, page three, page four, Page five, page six. Thank you, and I thank uh, Mary and uh, Andrew in particular for uh, helping us uh, uh, just tidy up those uh, minutes. So secondly, we go on to item 4B, which is the meeting on the 7th of June. So again, page one. Uh, microphone, please, Mary, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just a tiny point. Tony Norton was actually at the meeting on the um, 7th of June, so he's down here as apologies. But right. If that could just be amended for the record. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll make that amendment. Thank you very much. Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six. So with that one amendment, if you're happy that I signed those as a correct record of those meetings. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we have the action uh, matrix. There is only one item uh, which is on the matrix and it will lead to a further discussion <coughs> at a later date on mental health prevention. I think that's right, Andrew. Thanks very much. So we, we now move on to the uh, items, uh, specific items on the agenda today. Uh, we have some quite meaty items. Uh, several, uh, the first report is about commissioning uh, policies, uh, but also uh, we have later uh, reports on the consultation process, which will be of interest to members of the public, and also later an item for information only, really, to this committee, which is about uh, 
the, uh, our, our health uh, 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 policies in uh, uh, central lengths, uh, which uh, is for information to this committee because it is being dealt with by the two local CCGs. You might say, well, why is it here? It's here because uh, the way in which it's approached in, in central Lancashire uh, will uh, influence uh, other consultations that take place elsewhere, and it's therefore important for this committee to understand how that's being dealt with. So, first of all, then, we'll deal with uh, commissioning uh, policies, uh, which Elaine Johnson is the lead presenter for this item and is the chair of the working group, which has taken the lead on redrafting and consulting on these policies. Um, there's a cover paper, but before we get to each of the six uh, items, uh, the suggestion is that uh, a decision is made on each as we go along. Uh, so uh, if that's OK, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, yes, I'm very, very happy that we should do that, and I would like us to, to work uh, through the policies. I'd like to start by saying I don't intend to talk at you for 45 minutes. Um, so I'm, my intention is to start with some general introductory remarks about the policy development process and then to work through each of the policies in turn. Um, and I will be going through them in the order in which they were described in the overarching briefing paper for reasons which will probably become apparent as, as we go through. So apologies that they're listed in a slightly different order in your pack. Uh, but I'll give you references to that as we go along. So just for, for uh, context, I wanted to remind you that the Commissioning Policy Development and Implementation Group was something that was set up about uh, 18 months ago under the auspices of the Lancashire and South Cumbria um, Collaborative Commissioning Board, which predated uh, this committee. And it was set up to enable the eight CCGs to work together to address areas uh, where policies were judged to be the right mechanism to ensure the most evidence-based and effective use of NHS resources um, equitably across the whole of Lancashire and South Cumbria. So that's what we've been doing. Um, if you look at the beginning of your briefing paper, you can see that we have what we feel is quite a comprehensive and robust process to do that, consisting of evidence review that is always led by a clinician, often a public health colleague, um, which then progresses through uh, various stages of clinical and public engagement and equality and impact assessment, the results of which are taken together by the, co the Commissioning Policy Development Group, uh, which then makes the recommendations that you see before you today for each of these policies. So that's the process that we've gone through. Um, it should be quite apparent from the policies themselves. If you look at the first page of each policy, you can see a document control table that actually describes the changes that have been made at each stage. So hopefully that will be quite clear. So having said that for introduction, I'd like to move uh, to the first policy that I'd like to talk to you about, which is actually the policy for photorefractive surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that is uh, item 6C in your pack. Okay. Um, this is, a, this is an example of something that we felt was fairly straightforward. Uh, the rationale for doing this policy through this group was that CCGs already had policies in place across Lancashire, which were already entirely consistent, but had just reached their review stage. So what we were tasked with doing was making sure the clinical evidence, uh, understanding whether the clinical evidence had changed and whether the commissioning policy needed to change as a result. Um, our process showed us that the clinical evidence for this had not changed uh, significantly, uh, but fundamentally the view of the policy development group, which was the same as the view of the CCGs previously who'd done these policies separately, was that this was not an intervention that was an appropriate use of NHS resources. The rationale for that is that actually people with sight uh, deficiencies can, I, can, through the NHS, access uh, optician services and have glasses and can choose to have contact lenses. Uh, we did quite an extensive piece of work through our public engagement process and actually consulting with some disability groups to make sure that we had not overlooked a group for whom neither of those would be appropriate. And the other thing I should say that's true for all our policies is that even when we have a policy statement here, we have the ability for an individual case to be considered as an exception to policy, and that's through our indiv individual funding request process, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Uh, so that's all I would really would want to say on that policy, and I would just like 
to ask you if you're willing to ratify it. Are there any questions or comments on that? Thank you, sir. Oops. What I would like to know is what exactly was the process of public and patient engagement? Uh, we have a, a kind of tiered approach to public engagement on the basis of the, whether it's a new policy or an existing policy and whether we are proposing any kind of change in the nature of that change. This policy came into the bottom tier of that, so our engagement was done through CCGs, mainly through websites uh, and online. So there was an online survey that people could, could complete. Um, and we didn't get anything through that online survey that would lead us to make any changes. You'll see later in the paper that with other policies we did, um, but that wasn't the case for this one. Okay. Any other questions on that one? Sorry, Jack. Yep. So just to be clear, this is an existing policy in place at the moment with no changes made to it. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? <coughs> So, is that agreed? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. we we'll move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like next to take you to the policy for excision of uterus for the treatment of menorrhagia. That's attachment 6A in your pack. Um, and again, it was a policy that had existed in, um, previously in individual CCGs, which were consistent in their approach. Um, the policies had reached their review dates. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there had been, in the time that the, the predecessor policies had been enforced, there had been a piece of nice clinical guideline published. Am I still? Yeah, I feel like I've gone very quiet. Can you still hear me? Mm, it's working a little. I'll keep talking. Wave if you really can't hear me. Um, Sorry. So yes, there were predecessor policies in place which were consistent. There had been a nice clinical guideline uh, published during the lifetime of those policies, and that was used as our reference source for the policy review. Uh, but that actually did not change any of the criteria for access that were in the policies. You can hear me? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, and again, neither clinical nor public consultation nor our equality impact assessment led to any proposals to change the policy. So it is actually being renewed unchanged if you're in agreement. Okay, and any questions or comments on uh, item four? What people don't sometimes realize is that it might seem like an easy option to just say, well, I don't want that. I want to have my uterus out. Now, as a man, I understand, you know, ladies in the room will say, well, what does he know? Um, but as a clinician who has seen these operations and go bad uh, in quite a lot of cases, uh, it would have been nice to have at least some of these medical treatments having to be tried first before somebody can just sort of say, I don't want to have them, and then be sort of uh, fast-tracked to have their uterus removed. Uh Yes, you, you've hit on a point that caused a great deal of debate during the policy development process. Um, I should make reference to the fact that actually one of the ICS bodies that is part of this process that wasn't specifically listed there is our Care Professionals Board, which is the clinical leadership policy. When we took this draft policy to CPB, which Andy chairs, uh, a number of months ago, exactly that point was raised. Um, we were in the situation where that, that wording that's there is the wording that's in the extant NICE guideline. So we actually went so far as to take legal advice, um, and we were advised that where there's an extant NICE guideline that makes a statement like that, we should not defer from it. The other issue that was raised and debated at quite some length through policy group and CPB is about the role of policy compared to the role of a clinician's and relationship with a patient and a treatment pathway. And we, have, we, were, we got quite helpful advice from the solicitors, solicitors that in, within a policy document, we should restrict ourselves to commissioning statements. It is our expectation that every, every patient would have quite lengthy discussions with a clinician before reaching that stage, and that most people would probably want to try one non-surgical, you know, something or other. So we didn't feel it was right to try and legislate for it for those reasons absolutely accept your comments. Um, we, we expect that to happen through the clinical discussions that would happen between the doctor and patient. Does that help? 
Yeah, I mean, as somebody who has had uh, to answer to a solicitor about why I didn't take that course of action, um, that is not always clear from what the patient perceives as well, I think. And I think, as it stands, whilst we don't have any other options because NICE has recommended it, I think I would disagree with it as a clinician because I think patient harm will come from this because of the fact that it is so easy to get um, a hysterectomy when there are so many other options that people perhaps will be put off if they read a leaflet, but there isn't a leaflet that comes with the, the surgery, because when you're at that stage and you're consenting, it's, it's very difficult to sort of not go through with it. But uh, I, I, I respect what you're saying, so that's fine. Um, thank you. My question's in um, relation to probably all these policies, is there isn't a review date on them, so how, I'm just wondering how long they're going to be. So, um, can I ask Becky to answer that? Of course. <laughs> The reason the review date isn't inserted pre-joint um, committee discussion is because obviously um, subject to any amendments it may not be ratified on the day so that will be inserted post-ratification and there's a three-year standard review period for all the policies that are developed. Okay. The only other thing I would add to that is if we were aware that, um, in fact it says in the policy, if there's new NICE guidance that would come out during that period, but also if there was a major new piece of clinical evidence, either about effectiveness or about safety of any of these interventions, that would prompt uh, an early review. Any further questions or comments? Uh, yes, Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for uh, clarity, is there a policy on the management of OME um, without the use of grommets? So like hearing aids and things like that. I just want to double check that I'm not seeing this in isolation without anything else around it. There isn't a policy for that, and the reason for that comes back to why do we have policies in the first place. So there are lots of things, in fact, the vast majority of the things that we do in healthcare are not covered by a commissioning policy. Our rationale for having commissioning policies is, based, is one of two general situations. One is that the evidence of benefit is perhaps um, unclear or restricted to certain groups of patients within the cohort of patients with that condition, which is the case here. The other situation, which we'll come on to later, is where you've potentially got a new intervention treatment or technology where the evidence base is actually quite sparse and you want to manage how you use that in patients as part of helping understand its effectiveness. So the answer is there isn't a policy because it will be about the standard treatment pathway for that and the policy comes into force at the point at which grommets are being considered. Okay. Just on that point, I think we need to be really clear. This is not treatment guidelines. There's a wealth of treatment guidelines for otitis media with effusion. Um, this is about commissioning policies. This is about our policy, about given all the other constraints we're working under, whether it's nice guidance or financial constraints or other clinical constraints. Um, this is the policies for what we will fund and commission, which is completely different from clinical guidelines about treatment of conditions, all of which continue to exist and which all our clinicians have access to. Okay, so in relation to item four on the agenda, uh, I think we've strayed slightly into five, but we'll come back to that. On item four, uh, <coughs> is everybody in agreement with that policy? Yes? Thank you very much. So we're going to five, which is management of OME using grommets. Uh, no, sorry, because I'm doing them in a different order, Chair. I'm sorry, I'm going to, going to speak next about uh, the management of low back pain using spinal injections and radio frequency denervations, which is attachment 6E in your pack. So apologies for that. I'll just give six, six, 6E, policy for managing back pain. Okay. Um, this is the first of the policies that come under a different criteria, so it's the first time where we're talking about something that we didn't have previous policies across Lancashire for, across all of Lancashire. The situation here was that our colleagues in Pennine Lancashire, that being East Lancashire and Blackburn with Darwin CCGs, uh, recognised that the use of these interventions in their um, CCGs were at odds with um, clinical evidence and likely expected intervention rates uh, compared to elsewhere in the country. So those two CCGs, prior to the establishment of the Lancashire-wide group, which I chair, 
um, had taken the decision to develop a policy for these interventions in these conditions. Um, when they had done that and we'd established the Lancashire-wide arrangements, this was, one, this was something that we recognised was actually a common issue across the whole of Lancashire and South Cumbria, and that there were some policies in existence elsewhere, but they, they varied in their scope and, and the access criteria that they applied. So the CP DIG group um, agreed to take the Pennine Lancashire policy and use it as the first stage um, in developing a Lancashire wide, by which I mean the evidence review stage that had led to the draft criteria for access. So it entered our Lancashire wide process at clinical engagement stage and then went through the rest of the process from there. Um, both after the Lancashire wide clinical engagement and public consultation and in the equality impact assessment, none of those resulted in any proposed changes to the access criteria. So the policy that you see before you today is basically the existing Pennine Lancashire policy. Um, the e effect of this policy will actually be to align clinical practice in Lancashire and South Cumbria with the prevailing national guidance, including a piece of NICE guidance um, for low back pain and sciatica in over the 16s. Thereby, we will be focusing the use of these two interventions in patients for whom there is the best evidence of clinical benefit and no longer using them in some patient groups where that evidence is actually not good, so where the, the evidence of safety versus benefit is less apparent. So um, that's all I would want to say. Just ask comments. Okay. Any questions or comments uh, over there and then Samartri? Uh, a point of clarity, really. Um, the document here talks about there being variation across uh, South Lancashire and Cumbria, but through the thing it talks about introducing a, a standardised policy, it then talks about no change. By the very nature of what you're describing there, if we're reducing variation, there must be some change to the policies. Now, you've just articulated there's no change to what I think was the, the basis, which was the Panine policy, but as I'm reading this paper, that policy was not applied across all the CCGs and all the geographic areas. If we're moving to a standardised policy, there must be change and implications in some areas. That doesn't come across clearly in this uh, paper. So can you just clarify that point for me? I'll do my best. No, apologies for that. Uh, you're absolutely right. That what, what, we was what we were trying to say was some CCGs didn't have policies. Some CCGs had policies that didn't have exactly the same scope as, as the Pennine Lancashire policy. They had done a very comprehensive and recent piece of work to look at the evidence around all patients who might access these treatments. Um, and therefore, that was what we used to go through our Lancashire process. And what we were trying to say was that actually the policy that we're proposing is adopted across the whole of Lancashire is unchanged from the current policy in Pennine Lancashire. Um, but you're absolutely right for some CCGs that will be a change. Sorry, but then I think it's really important that that is clarified because it's not clear in this paper what those implications may be for some areas. Thank you. I've got uh, a few questions. Uh, the first one relates to the first page uh, under eligibility criteria. Uh, it says maximum of two spinal facet joint and caudal injections. Does that mean one and an, one and one two or two and two four? Uh, it probably needs a bit more clarification around that. And then after that, it says prior to consultant referral, I would have thought that before undertaking any injection, there would be some consultant uh, input or consultant team, team input, so it doesn't quite clarify which consultant we are mentioning here. The third one is further down under B, it says neck and back, uh, neck surely shouldn't relate to lower back problems. So. I'm not quite sure why neck, neck should be mentioned here. And then going on to the next page, 2.1.3, specific low back pain. Under this, it mentions about various treatments for various uh, causes of back pain. Uh, uh, so it mentions about facet joint injections and all sorts of other things. But under eligibility criteria, it mentions only about caudal epidurals, 
and epidural injections. So uh, this seems to be not quite clearly enunciated what it's actually <coughs> telling us here. And finally, I think there's a typo on page 6, where it says, uh, under non-specific low back pain, uh, last line, C-section 8.2.3, probably mean uh, 2.1.3, perhaps. Um, yeah, so um, it may help to quickly address the issue around um, other CCG policies first. So the changes that for, um, I'm just counting, <laughs> um, three CCGs, there'll be the um, introduction of a new policy where there hasn't been a policy before, but for example in Morecambe Bay, there is a policy but your scope is much smaller. So um, the types of back pain that are covered by this policy have increased and the scope of the policy has been widened. So there's certainly some comments that we can send out to just clarify that to individual CCGs, what that impact may be. Um, to pick up, I, I will probably need to have a conversation with one of the clinicians who's led on the policy with some of the queries around the caudal versus epidural, because I am non-clinical myself. Um, but just to pick up and offer some assurance around the pre-consultation injections. That's because a lot of CCGs have um, MSK services commissioned in the community where there are extended scope practitioners who are trained to deliver these injections. So that would be the first um, line of intervention for these patients that would be um, triaged and treated in those services. And then if they remained refractory, then they'd be referred on to consultants. So that's why that, there's that allowance within the policy. Um, but it is why there is an allowance for a further two injections post-consultant um, referral because um, to remove that would mean that the range of options available to the consultant will be greatly restricted. Um, but yes, certainly in relation to the question in, um, regarding caudal versus epidural, I would need to get some clinical um, input on that. And I think the neck probably needs to be removed from there. The neck doesn't quite relate That's to That's just um, where we've back. amended the scope and it just needs picking up, yes. I yeah. think it's um, an, an oversight on the scope that was clarified. And, and so perhaps where the facility of uh, pre-trained extended scope practitioners is not there, there needs to be some, some kind of mention of, over there as well. Can I just come in? I think we need to be really careful here that we are not trying to redo the policy that has been around numerous groups, numerous clinicians for comment, been through all the various processes. And there is a temptation often when you're a clinician on a board like this to start talking about clinical things for obvious reasons. But actually, if we're going to rewrite things that have been through numerous clinical groups, I think it's a bit risky. So quite happy that we take back some of those specific points, but we've had massive clinical involvement. It's been agreed by Care Professionals Board. They've been through the various groups, including people from all the CCGs. They've been through the expert clinicians. They take account of the detail, nice guidance about all of these pathways. And I just think there's a bit of a risk if we start changing odd words and sentences here before ratifying it, that actually do we then start the whole process again. So quite happy to pick those points up for this, but we just need to be a bit careful that we don't redo everything again. Yeah, I, do, I do appreciate that. But at the end of the day, these policies have been brought to this uh, committee and therefore we have a clinical responsibility as clinicians to flag up any obvious problems. I'm not asking for, re for a rewriting, but all I'm asking, all, all I'm saying is because we are supposed to be ratifying or approving the policies, uh, there needs to be um, a feedback from here. Um, so that, that, that's it really. Yeah. Can, can I just, sorry, can I just check that you're not actually proposing to change any of the criteria in the policy? You, you have helpfully pointed out some things that we need to sort out around wording, but you're not, you're not proposing to change any of the criteria. Have I understood that? Okay, thank you. We'll take up those issues outside. Yeah. Um, so I, I think in terms of handling today, 
um, we have another meeting in public in a month's time, it would seem to be appropriate to, to make any further clarifications necessary and bring that document back for ratification. I'm just, yeah. just yeah, check for some happy. nods on that. Thank you. Is everybody happy with that proposal in relation... Oh, Mary, sorry. Thank you, Phil. Um, my comment is not so much to do with the, the content of the policy. It's an issue to do with presentation. The last two policies that we've endorsed were very clear about what the policy is in the specific circumstances we addressed. With this one, I'm less clear as to what exactly the policy is. And I think it's important that all of these policies are accessible to, to anyone, really, members of the public clinicians, insofar as it, uh, insofar as it goes. Uh, in this one, I couldn't actually uh, work out, that's probably me, what precisely the policy is um, in, in, in this instance. And I think that's probably an issue of presentation. I don't want to make a big deal of it today, because Amanda's absolutely right. I don't want to sort of reopen it. But it's just a general point about the presentation of policies. They need to have a clarity and an, and an accessibility about them. Yeah. Can I say, yes, I absolutely agree with you. I think what we're seeing here is um, an example of a policy that's been in development for quite some time and has gone through different phases. I think given that the proposal that's been made for us to bring it back next month, I think if you're in agreement with us to do some work on the presentation, I think we can do some simplification in that time as well. Okay, thank you. So is that course of action agreed for this particular policy? Yeah. Agreed? Thank you. In my, in my order, uh, it's it, uh, item 6D, which is the provision of insulin pump devices. Okay. Number seven in our reports. Okay, is my mistake? Yeah, okay. I think it's because the questions came out of the order. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, Becky has just pointed out to me that we don't think we actually took a ratification decision on the grommets policy. <laughs> So do you want to do that now or do you want me to come back to it? So, so, so if I may, I, I think we took one or two questions about the policy without you actually didn't. introducing yes, it. Sorry, so do you, that wish was to, my you wish to reverse and do the, the Gromit's policy now, do you? I think, um, we, I think, I think we need to present it and go to. through the structure okay. of presenting questions and then ask yeah. for ratification. My apologies for being confused. Can I refer you instead to item 6B and we'll just tie up the Gromit's one before we get into the more complicated things? Back so to Gromits. Back to Gromits, item 6B. I think it's number five, I think. Yes, number five. Section five in, this Section five in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, again, this takes us back to a situation where we had existing PC, uh, CCG policies uh, in force which had reached their review dates. Uh, they were consistent across Lancashire. Again, we undertook an evidence review followed by clinical and public consultation and equality impact assessment, none of which led to any change in the access criteria in the policy. If you look at the change control document, you will see that we did clarify the wording around the, the evidence of hearing loss having persisted for three months. Uh, that was because we initially had some quite cumbersome wording about a three-month observation period in primary care, which was pointed out to us by colleagues at the Care Professionals Board. Um, didn't actually reflect reality because GPs wouldn't see a patient continually for three months to check they still couldn't hear. So we've just clarified that wording. Other than that, it is uh, completely unchanged and it is actually in line with an excellent piece of nice clinical guidance for the management of otitis media with grommets. So I would like to ask for ratification. Please. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Grommets. No, so is that agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And apologies for the confusion. If we can now move on then to uh, attachment 6D, which is the policy for insulin pump devices. Seven in the body of the report. Number seven, policy on insulin pumps. Everyone's got that, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, context with insulin pump devices is that these are the subject of a, a mandatory piece of NICE guidance called Technology Appraisal 151, which was actually originally published in 2008. 
Subsequent to that, NICE has published, what, uh, which they're starting to do for a number of their policies, what they call a costing template, and that enables uh, CCGs to look at their expenditure against something and understand how it compares to what NICE would expect to see in their population. And so the, um, when we were asked to do this, there was some variation in whether or not there, were, there was access to insulin pumps and exact uh, criteria, but actually we looked at the costing template to look at our actual use of insulin pumps across Lancashire and South Cumbria. And what that showed us was that there was a lower than expected use, use of these devices in adults in Lancashire and South Cumbria, and a slightly higher than expected number of them being used in children. So the reason we've done this policy is that we've done that to try and make it absolutely clear to um, clinicians across Lancashire and South Cumbria when we expect patients to be able to access insulin pumps in line with the um, conditions in the NICE guidance. So it's entirely in line with NICE. We've just tried to make it very, very clear. Um, we did actually... Um, have some clarifications to the policy that were made as a result of public engagement exercises, which you can see on the change control uh, page of the policy. Um, again, there were some uh, ways where patients can uh, do things like carbohydrate counting and to kind of show how, how their diabetes is being controlled, which was not actually included in NICE, but patients told us, and you know, expert patients told us that this was equivalent to what was being asked for in NICE, so we felt it was reasonable to put that in. So it's intended to just explain different ways how you can demonstrate the same thing that NICE required to be demonstrated. Um, and some other things around um, how you, what the cause of diabetes is that wasn't actually described in the earlier guidance. But other than that, it's entirely in line with NICE. So. Okay, any questions or comments on this one? Looking around. No, is that agreed? Oh, sorry. Mary. Again, again Chair, this, this is just a presentation point. Um, I mean, Section 1.1 just feels like it's in the wrong place. Um, the, the statement of, the, of the, uh, the policy is very clear. Um, from one, one, two onwards, but section one, one it feels like it's in the wrong place and should be later in the document. It's a presentation point. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Do you want to just deal with that particular item or in terms of presentation? Um, I think it's because it's meant to be a precursor to the criteria at section 1.2, so... Um, whilst patients may meet the criteria section 1.2, if the pump isn't to be initiated in specialist centres, it wouldn't actually be commissioned, which is why it sits prior to the um, patient-specific criteria. It's an overarching requirement of the policy. Mary, are you Does convinced that by that or not? Not. Uh, not entirely, but I mean, it's... it's uh, the, the issue for today is about um, ratifying these policies, which I'm happy to do. There will always be presentational issues, perhaps something that could be picked up later. It just didn't read uh, quite comprehensively. Okay, thank you. Well, with that comment, are we... Sorry, does anybody else wishes to speak on this item? <coughs> no? Are we in favour of that then? Yeah. Yes? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will move us on to the final policy for today, which is that uh, item 6F. So I'm not sure which section you have that in. But it is the insulin, uh, sorry, continuous glucose monitoring and flash glucose monitoring devices. Section 8, if you're... Yes. Uh, well, thank you for uh, alerting us to that, but I think most colleagues will be happy for you to just uh, sit in the room and listen rather than contribute, if that's okay. That. Are we all happy with that? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. 
So the, the context of this policy is a little bit more complex than others. So first of all, to say when this work was begun, the scope of the policy was to consider the use of continuous glucose monitoring devices. Uh, which have been around for some time, and some of our CCGs had policies on them, they were not all consistent. So our initial task was to look at um, harmonising, if you like, bringing those together to a consistent policy. We began that work um, in the autumn of 2007, so we've, we've been at this for a year, I think. Um, we had not long begun that then than the, the first flash glucose monitoring device became available in the UK on the market. And the, a, a, a subcommittee of NICE called the Regional Medicines Optimisation Committee in the North issued a very rapid early review of that, which was first of all considered by the Lancashire Medicines Management Group, which is another group that looks at, sorry, uh, looks at medicines policy across Lancashire. Uh, they took the RMOC guidance and put it through their clinical consultation process and actually got uh, quite strong feedback from the clinical bodies across Lancashire and South Cumbria. And the nature of that feedback was that our clinicians did want to have access to this device. Um, however, uh, they, they recognised that actually the evidence base was very minimal at this point and that if it had been used in the way that originally was proposed by the RMOC North, there would have been issues around both cost effectiveness in terms of the benefit from it by, versus the cost of pr providing it and overall affordability for Lancashire and South Cumbria. So Lancashire Medicines Management Group uh, reached that point. They were aware that um, the policy group was already working on glu continuous glucose monitors. They recognised that these two devices had, I guess, a, a common, potentially common set of patients who might wish to access them. So they asked the policy group to, add, to extend the scope of our policy to cover flash glucose monitoring as well which we agreed to do, and we took the initial feedback from the LMMG clinical consultation and used that as the basis for the developing the criteria within the policy for flash glucose monitoring. The overall intent of the policy is to give a single clear position on access to both types of glucose monitoring devices to enable access for the first time for the new device. So this is where we're managing in something that's new, where we don't really understand exactly where the benefit is. And we've taken our recommendations in the round from that position from clinicians and the understanding of the potential cost of this um, were it not to be controlled some way, in some way by policy. So the recommendations that are in the, the draft policy are aimed at allowing those patients where we feel they're most likely to benefit based on the current evidence to access that device and to be consistent about all, both, all of these devices across Lancashire and South Cumbria. I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this item? <coughs> yes. It's clear um, that this has quite sort of uh, severe cost ramifications for the health economy. Um, and just like in the hysterectomy sort of uh, eligibility criteria, I do worry sometimes that we put in loopholes that perhaps are to no one's benefit. Because, for example, have an extreme fear of hypoglycemia. How would you be able to subjectively prove that uh, there is or isn't? And I think that puts clinicians in a very vulnerable state because fear of litigation will usually make you agree to something because people can make it seem like you rejected someone based on the fact that you perhaps weren't able to demonstrate that they had fear of hypoglycemia. Because that's a very sort of um, specific thing, isn't it? And I think that is a big loophole in this policy. Again, you've identified one of the real naughty issues when you try and write policy is how do you make policy absolutely objective and transparent when sometimes clini clinical circumstances are anything but. Um, I guess what I can say is we've done our best to define that where we're saying actually they are patients who would be eligible for some kind of monitoring device because they are monitoring a number of times a day. So these patients will be going through box after box of finger prick um, devices. 
because of their anxiety about their condition and this may be one way that is open to, pay, to clinicians to consider but we've also said that we expect this to be managed through specialist services so I, I guess you're, uh, you're one of your routes for as a GP would be to ask for the specialist service to take that view on a patient um, to make that judgment call with them. Uh, Jerry then Gora. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this relates partly to the earlier comment about uh, reviewer policies. While I, I have no issues over a three-year review of the policy, it, in new cases like this, it does suggest there needs to be an early review of the implications of the policy, both in terms of patient outcomes and in terms of the financial implications. So I would ask perhaps we consider that there is an early review of the implications than three years, which feels slightly uncomfortable for me. Okay. Um, I should also have said at the beginning um, that C CP Dig is called CP Dig because there's an I in there, which is for implementation. One of our other responsibilities after policies are developed and ratified is to monitor their impact. So we are working very hard with, with colleagues who understand the, uh, the data that we get from hospitals and elsewhere to make sure that we have really clear ways of understanding what's happening and that we will be able to act and that applies to every policy not just this one that we will be monitoring the impact positive or negative for any kind of unexpected consequence um, and hopefully you know we would then ex expect that to trigger an early review and we would let ccgs know that that's what we're asking for okay go Sorry, Elaine, can you just confirm a couple of things? So it's, it's had clinical scrutiny in line with best practice and it's nice guided. It's not nice. Sorry, it's, it's not nice guidance in the sense of having been through a formal nice process. Um, there is this separate situation which is aligned to nice where they've come up with these regional committees. That committee themselves have, have gone on record as saying that they didn't do a full review of the evidence for this, they did something very rapidly in order to have something available to the system at the point the flash glucose device became available. The continuous glucose monitoring is in line with NICE clinical guidelines. Flash glucose, is, we, we, don't, we don't have them. Okay, excellent. Okay. okay, any other comments? Is that agreed then, this particular policy? Yeah. Agreed? Um, just a general point relating to all of that. So as Adam pointed out, the, the last one we talked about could have considerable cost implications for us. Um, that's almost the whole point of doing some of this stuff. The more rigorous we are around policies for things which have no evidence of clinical benefit, the more we are in a position to invest in the things where there's clear evidence of clinical benefit, but which have big cost implications for us. So this is absolutely... Um, vital that we standardize some of these policies, not only because um, we need to be sure that we aren't wasting investment where there is no evidence of any benefit, but because new things are constantly coming along that can benefit patients that do cost a lot of money, but which we would want to invest in for the benefit of our patients. And so we have to see both sides of this and it may feel comfortable to try and um, be relatively relaxed about things that we know some people like but for which there's no evidence. But if we do that, we can't invest in some of these things that there is clear benefit. The other thing, just in addition, um, we've got three-year reviews on the policies once we ratify them. We do know there is work going on nationally around interventions of uh, the clinical effectiveness of interventions, and we may find that we need to bring things back to review to align with what's being standardised nationally, and some of these policies are affected. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, I should have mentioned some of these policies are affected by that ongoing consultation. Um, what we have done is just had a quick look at what's proposed in the consultation, and the current proposals are in line with our policies. So um, unless the only way we'd have to change them is if the consultation nationally changes the criteria. Thank you very much, Andrew. Just to uh, round off here and just... Um, summarise what we've agreed. Um, so firstly, thank you to Elaine and Becky for taking us through some pretty uh, detailed work. We've agreed five of the policies and we've asked for one to, to, to go back for some further drafting and clarification. The policies that we've approved relate to photorefractive surgery, excision of uterus, management of otitis media, 
provision of insulin pump devices and continuous glucose monitoring. The policy that's coming back is obviously the one I haven't me um, mentioned. And given the point that Jerry just made, we are confirming the remit of your group to continue the implementation um, and monitoring of the impact of these policies. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Thank you very much. And, and again, thank you to uh, both our colleagues for explaining those to us. Uh, we move on to uh, item uh, eight, which is the consultation framework. Uh, th this is one of the most important documents that's come before the uh, joint committee. Uh, Gary Raphael will, uh, I understand, introduce this uh, item, which is about how we better coordinate uh, the consultation ac across, the, uh, across Lancashire and South Cumbria. Uh, and so, Gary, uh, I think uh, it's you on. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? That's okay. Um, I'd just like to introduce uh, Mitchell Gadd from Freshwater. Uh, Freshwater are working with the NHS TU to advise us about uh, the best way of uh, doing some of these things. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief introduction, and then if there are any questions uh, between Mitchell and myself, we'll, we'll look to answer, answer those questions. Um, the rationale for this document um, that's before this committee um, is, is that before we embark upon any formal engagement, involvement, and consultation activities, we should have agreed um, as a committee um, um, a framework for the conduct of such activities so that members of this committee um, are able to hold management to account for the successful performance of the duties outlined in the document. Um, and many of these duties are legal duties uh, that we have upon us. And it also gives uh, the public and other stakeholders a clear view on how we, as a health service in Lancashire and South <coughs> Cumbria, um, are expecting to undertake these activities. Uh, so for that reason, it, it, it is, uh, as the chairman has just said, an, an important document. Um, the intention is that for any engagement, involvement, pre-consultation and formal consultation for large service change uh, within Lancashire and South Cumbria, um, that uh, uh, all of that should be subject to the framework that's outlined in this, in this document. So uh, if an individual um, CCG or individual CCGs um, or groups of CCGs um, are undertaking a consultation, um, our desire is that it will be in line um, with this framework. So we're sort of setting the standard uh, for the whole of Lancashire and South Cumbria. And we're asking the Joint Committee of CCGs to adopt this as their engagement um, and consultation framework. Um, just a few words on its development. Um, we have um, um, looked at a draft um, before in order to get it um, ready for this particular committee meeting. Um, and following feedback from some of the some of members of the joint committee and also some further reflections that uh, that we've had on the content of the document we've done a bit more work to clarify <coughs> the respective responsibilities of the joint committee and the management structures that support these important activities um, so the legal duties of the joint committee and the supporting and facilitating role that's provided by our collective management as an ICS has now been clearly differentiated in the document. Um, and I trust that um, members of the Joint Committee will see that quite clearly in, in the version that you've got before you. Um, we have obtained um, on the previous draft a legal view um, on the report. It's something that came through from, um, from Graham. Um, we've done that. And we will do so again um, once it's clear that no further amendments are required. So if, if anything comes out from this committee, we'll take them on board and then we'll just do the final sweep um, from the legal side. Um, so just to clarify what I'm asking um, in, the, uh, in the cover report, um, the framework is a mixture of legal and other mandatory requirements, but there are also aspirational aspects in relation to best practice. Um, so uh, discussions that I had with uh, Mitchell and, and colleagues from Freshwater were, do we just focus on the purely legal stuff or do we have something that's comprehensive? And we decided that uh, the committee needed to be clear, um, have a comprehensive and clear view about how we intend to undertake these activities in total, not just focus on, on, the, on the minimal legal aspects of this. Um, so, um, um, if there are any changes in practice, because as we undertake consultations, we will learn how to do things better. 
we will incorporate those changes into this document and we will bring them up back to the Joint Committee so that you are fully apprised um, of the developments that have taken place. Um, but of course, the legal duties won't change, but how we do these um, consultations and engagement will change as, as we learn. So the committee um, is asked to adopt this um, as their um, engagement and consultation framework. And uh, Mitchell and I will be happy to take any questions that members of the committee may have. Thank you. Um, I've had an indication from Lawrence um, uh, there will be others, I'm sure, and Gora. Uh, so, Lawrence, to start off with you. Thank you, Chair. Can I just say what an excellent document this is? Um, there's obviously a lot of hard work gone into it um, from a local authority perspective. Uh, not only do we welcome the consultation and engagement, um, but also our involvement in that process. And there might be things that we may be able to assist to get the wider message out through our comms teams. Um, it was just one uh, thing that I noticed on page 18, which is uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph down. Perhaps on, on the um, second sentence, we could look at some rewording. Local campaign groups sometimes seek to thwart change by seeking judicial review of the public decision. Um, I'm not quite sure that's appropriate. Um, it is a legitimate process in law, um, and perhaps we could say something around uh, local campaign groups sometimes seek judicial review of the public decision. Thank you, Chair. 18, paragraph 4. Yep, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, point 18, yeah, thank you, thank you, Lawrence. Um, that, uh, that makes sense, and I'm happy to make that change. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Gora. It just Lancashire Care is down as an overarching organisation, uh, but it's also uh, a local organisation to some of us providing community services. Yeah, that, that can you hear me? Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, I wasn't sure which ones to put them in. Are you suggesting all of them, Gora? Yeah, okay. Is it in Pennine? Is, is there parts of Pennine as well, Blackburn? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think the policy is much clearer than the previous version I've seen, so I welcome the policy. I'm not proposing any change to the policy. I'm just wondering how often this uh, consultation strategy board will be meeting whether it's ad hoc, and I'm also wondering how we, as the sort of uh, the body it reports to, will be kept informed, will we be receiving minutes or what? Um, I think that as we are developing um, our strategies uh, across Lancashire and South Cumbria, and indeed within individual localities, if they are significant change, um, then um, I think, I, I suspect that this particular group will be meeting quite, um, quite regularly and therefore I would expect any um, issues and briefings to come through to the Joint Committee. Um, this, is a new, um, this, this is a new proposal um, about the way in which we do this, and the intention was to make sure that the different things that are going on in the different areas are coordinated in some way. Um, so when, when, we've, um, when we are seeking to ensure that this policy is implemented, um, it could be that we're needing to have discussions with different parts of Lancashire and South Cumbria to tie up um, and coordinate our efforts. And as we recognise that um, there are perhaps similarities or need to be more fully coordinated, we will develop um, our plans around that and make sure that the committee is fully apprised of that. So it, it, could, be, it could be fairly regular um, that those, those updates come back. Specific local concerns, but we want to make sure that they 
Mary. Mary. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with colleagues that this is a um, significantly improved policy from the, from the earlier version that we've, uh, or, or a framework from the earlier version we've seen. Um, I suppose like many of the CCGs in the room, we took this to our, to our governing body for um, discussion and consideration, and uh, there is certainly support for the framework, but there's a, still a nervousness really around the decision-making responsibilities and the, the fact that uh, the legal duties remain with the CCGs, which we, we, which we understand. Um, and I was going to suggest that as well as adopting the framework, we say we adopt it subject to ongoing engagement with the CCGs to ensure compliance with the legal duties. I think that would give a measure, a measure of comfort to, uh, certainly to my CCG, in terms of being aware that the, the legal responsibility in this area re rests with the CCGs. Um, and whilst we support the framework, we don't want to lose sight of that overall um, responsibility. Uh, Geoffrey. Um, Sorry, uh, I think an overall point, and I certainly agree. Uh, Chair, I just wanted to come back on the point that Mary's made. Um, so the way that the way the document is written at the at, at the moment is that this is the this is the framework for the joint committee of CCGs, um, and because we've done this piece of work, we also think it's relevant to guide what individual CCGs may wish wish to do. So. Um, so in, in my mind at least, um, this, this is about making sure that the way in which the um, decisions that are delegated to the Joint Committee and the way in which we manage engagement and consultation for those issues is what this primarily relates to. But it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's written in a way to express what we think the good practice is and therefore <coughs> can also be relevant to individual CCGs or groups of CCGs. So I'm just I'm just testing with Mary whether or not that's that's clear. Mary, may I just add to what Gary's just saying? You, you, you suggested an amendment, and it was subject to um, CCGs. I think the way that Gary's just set that out is that this helps the CCGs to discharge their statutory duties to effective comms and engagement, where we're particularly working collectively. So subject two is a qualification statement, isn't it? That this is actually about helping us to discharge some consistent legal duties. Thank you for that clarification. I mean, I'll happily go with that so long as we record it in the minutes to that effect, because I think um, I, I just need to be sure that we've addressed the nervousness among, um, uh, among my colleagues about how this will work in, in practice and a concern about uh, maybe over-centralisation, which I know is not the intention, but so long as those assurances from Gary and, and, and Andrew are incorporated in the, in the minutes, I'll be quite happy with that and withdraw the suggestion that we need to make it subject to. Okay. It's just a matter of uh, technicalities, really. How, how do the public get to know that there is a website consultation or something similar like that? So if the, if the public don't know that there's a consultation going on, like, like say, for example, an online consultation going on, how do the public get to know? So if they don't know, they can't respond. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the, the framework itself sets out the, the principles of good public engagement and involvement, and part of that is ensuring that there's one of the principles of that is that there's visibility of, of consultation and engagement. And by that, it means that the public, that it's visible, that they can see it, they hear about it, they read about it in newspapers, that there's advertisements as there should be when there's a consultation. So in, clearly, this is a, a, a guidance document. There are certain things which are set in stone, laws and requirements and responsibilities that, that people who lead consultation have to abide by. But in terms of a principle, um, it does uh, recommend that there is that visibility of consultation and therefore 
um, it's incumbent on those that, that are carrying it out and leading it at the CCG level that, that people are aware of it. So that, that comes down more to the kind of, I guess, the, the tactics of following this, this guideline so that there will need to be things put in place that make people aware of it. Uh, I think, Neil, is it on this particular point, before I bring others in, that you want to add? Yes, go on then. Yeah, just, just to respond to Samantha, and I think it, it kind of covers Geoffrey's point as well, but there is a considerable amount of work going on across Lancashire and South Cumbria looking at how we're bringing together and certainly working with those communications teams and networks to really kind of join up those, those kind of bits of work. So... You know, for example, the diff each of the different CCGs today has been tweeting about the fact that this meeting takes place and have put it on their website. So I think there's a joined up piece of work that's going on, and I think we can certainly do some work to make sure we bring it back to this committee, as Jeffrey's asked there. Maybe I think that'll make it clearer. Uh, a number of comments, I suppose. First one is um, welcome the document. Uh, and I think it's important to take it in the spirit of a developmental document and something we learn and progress with. Uh, I'm very mindful that much of the content is very much in line with NHS England's guidance around large-scale service change, so every CCG should feel and recognise that. Uh, a couple of uh, comments. I think, um, like everything with these things, is until it feels real and you can touch it, it's a little bit difficult. So uh, perhaps a suggestion about a couple of examples from around England or other areas where large-scale service change has, has gone through this type of process through a joint committee might help people so we can actually describe uh, an example. One of the problems for me is, is large-scale service change means something very different to lots of different people. So uh, just having some examples of what we really mean with this might just help everybody feel a bit more comfortable. Um, and my final observation, uh, I'm really pleased to see that it does show that the uh, board reports through to the joint committee. Uh, I think that's very important from an accountability point for the CCGs. My, my only uh, suggestion is we might want to relook at the terms of reference of the joint committee because I don't think the scope of large service change may or may not be covered by the Joint Committee's delegated authority at this moment. So it's perhaps an early heads up that that needs to be looked at before we go too far down this. Yeah, for all sake, um, I'm very grateful this has been checked out legally. I think, don't think anybody here is opposed to the fundamental principles behind this of coordination, and it is a good document. There's no question about that, as um, our CTG supported the overall approach of the document. We were still concerned, though, that the way it's written, it did look as though this was being a, a delegated matter from CCGs to this joint committee. Now, I know that's not, not, not the intention, but some of the wording, I think, still implies that. Um, for example, um, on page 7, uh, the ICS on behalf of the CCGs will use Communication and Engagement Strategy Board to assess the appropriate um, level of derivative and engagement consultation. So, so, so this board is now assessing how the CCGs are doing the engagement against this strategy. Now, if you're assessing it, it implies that you actually have some influence and say over that. And if we aren't satisfied it's, a, it's doing it properly following that a, 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 a assessment, what power has it then got? Now, if the lawyers are saying that's okay, great. But I must admit, uh, our, our uh, CCG said, we need to clear, at this point, we've not been asked to delegate it here. We wouldn't necessarily be opposed to doing that, but we've not been asked to delegate it here. And I would want, want to record in the minutes that we have had very clear legal advice that there'll be no chance of um, this document being used to undermine any consultation process being carried out by the CCGs. If they get that insur assurance that the lawyers have said that, then I'll, I'll back down, because I'm not a lawyer, and I'll take advice of experts. Uh, but that, even the reading of it, to me, still implies that this, this matter has, has been delegated here. I don't think it has been. I, I'll say I wouldn't be opposed to it being delegated, actually, but it hasn't been. I just need to get the language clear. So I'm happy with the reassurance, if that is confirmed, that the lawyers have said that this document is, uh, won't, wouldn't give a basis for a challenge to... Uh, a major change process. Yes. Um, so perhaps just to clarify um, the, the thinking behind the writing um, of, of the document. So um, as I've said, that the, the document is about um, 
this is the document of the Joint Committee of CCGs. So, so for issues which have been delegated by the CCGs to the Joint Committee of CCGs to undertake, if, if, if there are some big service changes, for instance, across the whole of Lancashire and South Cumbria, then that would be within the remit of this committee and not in the remit of the individual CCGs. So to the extent that um, the members of this committee are overseeing um, how consultation engagement activities are taking place, um, whether or not um, the managers who are running and, and, and facilitating and helping the, the joint committee of CCGs to undertake um, that process on the joint committee's behalf. That's, that's where the oversight of the joint committee lies. It's not the intention, so when, I, I'm just wondering whether or not we've used a shorthand of CCGs rather than the joint committee of CCGs, and I wonder if that's where some of the confusion might be uh, in this, because the intention is that this is the, this is the, um, this is the framework for the joint committee of CCGs. Yeah, and as I said earlier, it, uh, we think that because it's, it's um, identifying what we think best practice is, it could also be used by individual CCGs to guide the way they, they do things. But this is, this is only for the Joint Committee of CCGs, formally is only for the Joint Committee of CCGs. I think that would assist, because certainly that paragraph reads as it is on behalf of CCGs, not the Joint Committee, so if that was clarified, that would be helpful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Adam, then, I uh, think... Adam. Just on a slightly broader point, but you know, I agree with what Gary just said. There is something about this is not necessarily for things that are just individual CCG things, but what we are all committing to is that we have some coordination of what is happening in individual CCGs because there is risk around independent parallel engagement and consultation unless we're holding a ring around understanding where these things overlap and what everybody's saying. Adam. Um, like others, I agree that this is quite a good document. I think uh, we know from the commissioning policies uh, section that we've just had that it's really important to have standardization and coordination across the whole patch. Um, but I think it really needs to be said that the, uh, the, the engagement team at the ICS needs to be appropriately resourced as well, because obviously this will come with uh, quite a lot of extra work. And, all you need is, you know, uh, three or four different uh, segments of the ICS having uh, to utilize the engagement team and, and things could crumble very quickly. So I think if we want to make this robust enough, the, uh, the team needs to have the appropriate resources. Having said that, I think also it would be really appropriate and uh, important to note that there is some excellent engagement going on at sort of grassroots levels as well. Uh, so if we are doing sort of engagement on a wider level, it isn't necessary for the team, the central team, to need to do everything themselves, like people have said. It, it, it is really important that we utilize the teams on ground level as well, because they will have developed a good level of trust with the community groups and other um, uh, sort of uh, local residents. So I think that will aid the cause of the ICS. Um, on page seven, when I was reading the assess the appropriate level of delivery, I, I was seeing it more as, uh, as Amanda says, that we, we will look at if there are other pieces of engagement going on in two or three different patches, that we coordinate that so that there is the same level of engagement and, and sort of uh, consultation going on uh, so that we don't have to duplicate work. So I, I kind of read that in a different way. Yeah. Uh first point i think it was um an excellent point in terms of the 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 good work that's going on at ground level and 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 clearly there are there's kind of two i guess broadly speaking two main things that the the the, the framework sets out that it wants to achieve one is is that coordination that amanda was talking about across the patch that we know what's going on that, that there isn't duplication but there's an awareness across the ics of, of the work that's going on and secondly that that good work that is going on is learned from and if there are any examples of that then that's adopted that best practice that that you know intelligence whatever it might be is is then utilized and that we can share that learning so that anything we do pick up and good good practice that happens then we um we can benefit from that um and and, and certainly that picking up your point there in terms of the wording that as a general point that's what the wording should express in, in the document yeah Um, may I just, yeah. just add one final one? Um, I, I do think the Joint Committee should um, agree with Jeff's earlier suggestion that regular communication and engagement reports come through to this committee. 
Uh, I think that will be addressed by uh, responding to Adam's point about capacity to do that. And whilst we've had a, quite a governance conversation, the main reason why we're trying to agree this is because we need to discharge these communication engagement responsibilities more effectively in, in the public domain than we have been doing. So, so we're doing it because we've got to be more credible, coherent, evidence-based and honest, which is one of the things that people were saying to us before we started about what we need to do. So I think that's, that's the premise, even though that was a slightly technical conversation. Okay. So, um, where I see it is that we have agreed in, in, in uh, principle, we have agreed this document subject to uh, embracing the remarks of Lawrence and, and Mary and Jerry and, and Jeff. Graham, what, do I take it you were satisfied with the explanation that you received? Indeed. Right, was. so we can not incorporate that because it's been dealt with, right. So, subject to those uh, other contributions of uh, nuances and, and changes and improvements, uh, which I think has been taken on board that we will incorporate, Gary, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, are we happy to agree this document as, a, as the <coughs> policy for consultation? Okay? Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to item nine. Uh, which is uh, the overview of our health, our care. Um, some people will have seen uh, some of this before from uh, Dennis. Uh, uh, and I think it's important to note, uh, particularly for members of the public here, that this consultation will be carried out by the two local CCGs and not by the Joint Committee. And so you might say, well, and other colleagues might say, well, why is it coming here? Uh, and the reason it's coming here is uh, was uh, exemplified in the previous discussion that's taken place, that it's important that the joint uh, committee uh, sees uh, what's going on in the particular consultations in local areas <coughs> and uh, tries to ensure that there's a degree of consistency. And that was part of the purpose of the policy that's just been agreed. So uh, with that, Dennis, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just before I kick off, just to go through the, the purpose of, uh, of the update today. So there's two purposes. Uh, the first one is to give an executive overview of the Central Lancashire Integrated Care Partnership work, which is how we are coming together to transform the whole of the care system. And the second part is to give an update on the acute sustainability part. So there's two very specific uh, objectives. And the recommendations from uh, the report uh, quite or hopefully quite simple ones, to accept the update and confirm the processes described uh, to manage the acute sustainability, uh, including the pre and post engagement um, and consultation processes. So that's the objectives. Um, I'm ably going to be uh, supported by Andrew, who's going to press the buttons for me, I believe. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Okay. Um, Slide one, um, we'll just go through um, a, a quick overview of what's contained uh, in the Central Lancashire Integrated Care Partnership. That's what the RCP stands for. And you'll see there on the left-hand side is our triple aims, um, very similar to what lots of other economies have. It's about how we improve population outcomes, improve the experience and the quality of care and services that people receive, and do it all in a way which is affordable and gives best value for the taxpayers and the public and really what we're doing it all for is to get excellent resilience of the care system so that that's the purpose of it um, we established the care uh, the integrated care board only in april uh, 2018 uh, there'll be colleagues around the room who've been working on vanguard systems for quite some time have been working on this for a lot longer um, but we've moved really quickly um, over, a, over a very short number of months. You'll see on there the type of members within that Integrated Care Partnership Board from our acute provider, obviously the CCGs, community mental health provider. GPs have all come together as one uh, entity as well in central Lancashire, for, I believe, for the first time. Um, and we've got representation from the voluntary uh, charitable and faith sectors as well. Move us on, please, Andrew. This is just a, a, a diagram of what we call the big seven strategic platforms. I'll go into a little bit more detail about what they are, but just to sort of give an overview about why we've even bothered describing them. Certainly in our experience of transformation in big systems, 
you've got to get certain things in line. So if we say, right, we're just going to change every clinical care service to be the best they can possibly be, but we don't take uh, due consideration to, well, how are we going to afford to do that? How do we make sure resources work best and deliver great value? Then we're not actually providing what people actually want, which is sustainable services. Equally, if we don't engage the right care professionals in all the changes that we, we, we try to make, for example, if somebody like me who's not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a clinical professional, just locks myself in a room and think, okay, this is the way we're going to redesign diabetes services, that clearly is not going to work because I'm not, a, not an expert in that area. So we've got to bring care professionals alongside the people who use those services and listen and use their insights to change the way the services are going to work. And that's why we've got something called clinical care reform. Thanks, Andrew. Um, that's just a... Uh, well, you can't see it. Um, but if you could see it, it would be more of a, more of a, a description of each one of those seven areas. Um, and what you'd have seen on the right-hand side of the model was where the acute sustainability piece fits in. Now, it's a very, very important part of the transformation in central Lancashire, but it's not the only part, and it's important to understand that. But it is a part that's governed by the type of processes that Gary's just taken us through. We know we've got to um, do it in a diligent way. We know this, it's rules-based. We know there's uh, all sorts of different things we've got to do to satisfy NHS England and public scrutiny systems, etc. This isn't just something we can just do because we feel like doing it. It has to follow a set of due diligent processes. And I, for one, really welcome the previous discussion because um, I've been involved in these type of things before in other areas and it's very, very complex and I think it just makes a great deal of sense if we harmonise our processes right across Lancashire and South Cumbria. So I really do welcome that. Just moving on from that, um, we have got to take a much more in-depth look at the way Clinical work streams lead to sustainable clinical services. And not just clinical services, I keep reminding myself, they're not just clinical services, they're all care services. It's so the way we connect care, uh, clinical services to social care services, voluntary services, etc., has got to be done in a really robust, clear, transparent way, gives people the opportunity to engage with us, give us their experiences, and we can tailor those experiences into future models. Uh, and, and that's the, the, um, the particular model we'll, we'll be applying. Um, certainly when I've talked, since I've been in the Central Lancs area, and I've been involved in many committees, from scrutiny committees, etc., there's something that keeps coming back round the loop. Most people can understand the need to make clinical services or care services really effective and efficient. But the question comes, it's not just about interventional care. What happens, because most people are citizens. We're citizens 99.9% of the time. We're patients 1% of the time or 0.1% of the time. So let's stop talking about the way we do things for patients. It's about for people in communities and it's about wellness. So how are we going to do that, incorporate that into our systems of change, systems of care and the way in which people engage with us and tell us how to do that? That's really important. Um, I've probably touched on that uh, now, Andrew, so I'll just quickly move on. Out of hospital. Now, it depends who you talk to. Some people actually like the term out of hospital because it's pretty clear. People understand what hospitals do. They understand what GP practices do or your opticians, etc. But if we talk about out of hospital, all the type of care and systems of engagement and well-being, that doesn't mean you have to, anybody has to go into an institution made out of bricks or stone somewhere and be in a hospital bed. That's a little bit more difficult to describe. Uh, unless somebody's got a better description, just using the working title of out of hospital for the time being. But it's how we go about doing that. Now in central Lancashire, we believe that the fulcrum for out of hospital care is general practice. It's general practice connected to other professional services that work in the community, for social services, voluntary and faith sector, uh, experts, etc., and patient groups, patient and public groups who all work together in in economies of or networks of around about 50, 30 to 50,000 registered people. Now, we believe that's the fulcrum for the out of hospital system, but it's got to be developed and it's got to be invested in over a long period of time. 
not over a year, not over two years, over a generation. So some examples on there of the things we're doing around how do we truly integrate care when we've got, in the main, over the last 20 years, competitive arrangements. So one public service will compete against another public services. We've got things like tariffs. All that needs to change. We need to harmonise. We need to bring people and professionals together to deliver optimal care in an integrated way. Looking at locality models, so this is what I said about networks and in real communities where real people can really see, feel what's going on and can influence the shape of those services. And also in health and wellbeing hubs, this is sometimes for just economies of scale, you can't do things on every street corner. We can't really do complex diagnostics on every street corner, it doesn't make so much sense. But we can do them in community hubs. There's no real reason why we have to send people into hospital to have certain diagnostics if you can have them in two or three centres in, in, within an area like Greater Preston or Chorley in South Ribble. And we'll be looking to see how, how we can do that. Progress to date, there's just some information there. I'm not going to go in, in a great deal of detail. And, and I guess for members of the public, I'd say things like, oh, we're investing one pound per head in, in, uh, in, in, in um, combined general practice. Probably don't mean a great deal, uh, and it won't. But actually, what the purpose is uh, of bringing it here is to say, if we're really serious about developing the out-of-hospital networked primary care community services, then effectively we've got to invest in it. And uh, for those who attended our AGMs uh, last week, one in Great Preston, one in Chorley in South Ribble, you'll have heard me say that there's a statistic that always really bothers me when I, I look at statistics in health. And my favourite one is, we spend more on the uh, drugs that GPs prescribe than we actually spend on primary care itself. Now, I think that's a damning statistic. It shows a chronic underfunding of the primary care system in, in, in the UK market. And I think we need to address that. Hence the reason why we're, we're doing these investments around primary care at scale, building integrated care networks, etc. Okay, moving on to uh, the acute sustainability piece, which is, I guess, what a lot of people are really interested in. Um, We've gone out and spoke to lots of people. Um, we're going to speak to lots more people. We're going to do a lot more engagement. But ultimately, the case for change about why certain things have to change is really quite clear. The way in which we've got acute services working, not just in central Lancashire, but in a lot of other places, is built on a 40 or 50-year-old clinical model. Things have changed. Society has changed. People are living longer, thankfully. But some people living longer are not living healthier. And therefore, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a requirement for the services to move and transform with the way in which society is transformed. And we haven't done enough of that over the last 20, 30 years. So some of our hospital services are not shaped properly to meet the needs of today's society and the future society. Therefore, we need to change it. And what you'll see in the case for change is a lot of rationale, not coming from me, coming from people who know a lot more about me, about clinical services and care services, your GPs, your hospital doctors, your nurses, your care professionals, your social workers, etc. And they're to a voice saying things have to change. And when they say things have to change, we can't sit back and ignore them. We have to understand the need for that change, and then we have to understand what the options required to meet that change. And that's what the Acute Sustainability Programme is going to do. Some of the work um, uh, underway to develop the range of scenarios, because when, when we do these type of things, again, it's not a case of, you know, I'm wearing a grey suit today, I'm going to say the grey suit, sit in a room and decide what's going to happen. That's not the way it works. Lots of different people get involved in saying, well, if we've got all these challenges to the way in which the acute hospital systems currently work and we can't ignore them, then what are the options to improve them? And experts have got to come forward and say what the options are. And when they do that, we've got to get independent experts to assess whether they got it right or wrong. So that's the process we're going to be going through. And no, no option is off the table, and no option is favoured on that table, because that's not the way it works either. We've got to get all the options put down, and then independent scrutineers will look at them, 
And then on a range of different uh, criteria, we'll say, well, what, which of these options is the best one or best ones that will meet the needs of the people that we serve and can be, and very importantly, can actually be delivered. So if we were to say the best option is to, uh, I'm not going to come up with any ridiculous uh, observation, but if we put down an option that cannot be delivered because we can't afford to deliver it, because, you know, the way in which... Uh, taxation works in this country in the way in which we get resources from the government to meet healthcare needs, it's incompatible, then it's pointless putting that option forward. They've got to be deliverable options. They've got to be clinically safe options. They've got to be options that are sustainable for the future and deliver what people really need. So the assurances from me, from our two GP uh, chairs, from the Joint Committee of the CCGs who are going to have to run this programme and for colleagues around the room are going to be scrutinising it, is that we'll be doing this through a truly due diligent process, we'll be applying all the rules, and we will welcome every part of scrutiny to make sure we do it properly. Just moving on from that, some examples of the type of um, um, stakeholder engagement we've been doing. And um, these are just examples, they're not the whole of it by any means. Um, but some really quite hard to reach public groups who have gone out there and reached them. And we need to do a lot more of them. Um, when I read this again earlier before I came here, and said, you know, between September 2016 and 18, that's two years, uh, around 2,000 people have actually taken time out to come and talk to us. That doesn't sound very much to me. That sounds like sort of half the attendance that Accrington Stanley would get. That's not that, lot, that much. But that's what we do at the early parts of these engagement sessions, we invite people to come out and talk to us in community centres, in town halls, etc. But we have to use modern technology to engage the broader population, the types of people who, frankly, just go about their daily lives and not really care too much about what we're talking about. But everybody needs to be engaged in this and have a voice, and that voice has to be heard. So we'll be doing a lot more about that. Apologies, I'm nearly at the end of it. I won't bore you too much longer. The next steps, you'll see there's a relatively uh, short uh, diagram to show what we've done to date around building the clinical case for change, outline the models of care, gain clinical consensus around that, and then we take that through the process I've described. The things we're going to be doing now until Christmas, uh, some technical stuff around financial case for change, so things have got to work out and got to be enabled to be delivered within the financial resources that we have. Uh, detail model of care, the clinical standards, service code dependencies. What that means is if we make change to one or we, we advocate change to one part of the healthcare or care system that might have a knock-on consequence to another one. So if we were to say right, we're going to take 50% of outpatient work uh, because it's office-based medicine, as long as somebody knows what they're talking about, you can do it anywhere. And tell all our GP colleagues in central Lancashire, ask from tomorrow you're going to have to do all this. Well, they'll say, well, there's a codependency on that. Number one, have we got the clinical skills to do it? Number two, have we got the resources to do it? So we can't just make willy-nilly decisions that has an impact on another part of the care system. We have to plan it really well. And these things take time. And then early next year, uh, we'll continue doing the pre-consultation business case drafting and continue to engage our people. And then early, at some point next year, after the election periods are out of the way, we can then move to a much more formal consultation with the public. So that's, that's the timeline. And for those who are, have got a really interesting governance, here's the governance diagram. There's always going to be one of them. And uh, this just describes how the, the, the governance features fit together. So as you can see from the top left-hand side, very clear through um, uh, the Health and Social Care Act that the CCGs, the two CCGs, are the legal consultors. Uh, we will be supported by uh, companies like Freshwater and, and our colleagues in, in, who do support services. We'll also be supported by um, the, the pre-engagement consultation strategy that Gary talked about earlier on. That's a really, really important piece of support. And when I read it, I heaved a sigh of a personal relief. I thought, thankfully, there's going to be a system in place that can oversee that can assist, that can provide some appreciative challenge, can make sure we're doing the right things in the right way. It's a really good thing. Um, we've got a shadow board, as I've described before. The two CCGs have formed the joint committee. 
underneath that you can see the type of activities that we need to take place to make sure that we're doing this in a proper diligent way and we can be challenged on the way we're doing it so that's the end of the formal presentation chair thank you very much uh, dennis that's uh, i think that's very clear uh, any questions from members of the committee doug um Preston, in particular, and Charlie, provide a range of specialised services, don't they, on behalf of either the Fylde Coast or the whole of Lancashire. I'm thinking of things like neurosurgery, gynae, plastics, cancer. Are they part of the remit of this? Are they excluded? Because the consultation population would be different significantly to the local services. Thanks, Doug. You're absolutely right. Because of the nature of the types of services that are provided in uh, uh, Lancashire Teaching Hospital, then it's all services are going to be contained within the um, this work up in the consultation exercise which ultimately means that there's a broader consultation than just in central lancashire and we'll have to work out that with our colleagues who support us thank you chair some fantastic work there thank you very much for that presentation um, I have to explain this to some of my colleagues back in other authorities, and, and the one question I've got that I would like clarity on is, um, as the public and patients are at the core of everything that we do, where would you see that being represented in, in your uh, presentation? Is it, are they a part of the big seven strategic platforms, or is it the triangle on, on the first page? Where, where's the, the community and the patient? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that really good question. Um, I guess it's, I don't want to sound, give an answer that sounds really banal, but the, the answer, simple answer is every part of it. So the acute sustainability part, which is you know the, the, the part that requires formal public consultation, clearly people, patients, citizens are going to be involved in that and have their say in that. But that's one part of it. The much bigger part of it is how we transform all care processes every part of the healthcare system, health and care system. Now, there is a conundrum about how people actually engage in that change. So we've got a view that if we build coalitions at proximate level, so in, in areas um, like, uh, I don't know, maybe Gora's area, you know, where he works with five or six practices, then the patient participation groups within those five or six practices would should and will be clearly involved in any clinical or care changes that take place in that economy uh, and that's I think I mean, it's just my personal view I'm quite happy to be disagreed with and get ideas from others it's how do we truly engage populations in their own care and that's a question that I don't think anybody's properly answered anywhere I've done research all over the place on this and some have done it better than others but how do you get populations to actually own the system and drive the system and to be stakeholders in that system? Um, I think for now, we say they, they will be engaged in every part of it. So it's in the initial triangle. It's in the, um, uh, the way in which we, manage, we, we, we set up networks of care at 50,000 level. It's also in things that we do, we, we, you know, how do we set strategies that says that for the for the next 20 years we're going to be doing a prevention strategy that looks something like this therefore we've got to engage with our colleagues in public health at Lancashire County Council and at district councils and borough councils so sorry a long-winded answer to your question because I don't have a very specific answer other than at every part of it any other questions or comments on this item Mary Dennis, if you could just go back to what you said at the beginning, really, in terms of uh, reminding us about what the ask is today. Well, what, what is it that you, you're, you're requiring of us? Because I certainly found that presentation extremely helpful, but just remind us as to what you need from us today. Thank you, Mary. Uh, just two hopefully simple things. One is um, to accept the report, and, uh, and, and, and the second thing is to give a view the, the, whether the processes that I've described that represent the, what we're doing in central Lancashire is compatible and in line with what you as colleagues on a joint committee would expect us to be doing, in particular the, um, the, the prior subject around how we're going to be doing engagement and consultation across the system. Do you feel that what we're describing 
is compatible with that policy. Okay, any other comments or questions on this? Andrew, yes? So I think in terms of um, many of the areas you described, Dennis, particularly the ones around the, the changes in services in communities and around populations, the central lengths uh, group are doing very much the same as, as many other places. I think in terms of your answer to Doug, as this process develops, the, if there are potential impacts on some of those specialised services, we're going to need to understand those really clearly from a whole uh, Langston and South Cumbria perspective, or potentially from parts of that. So I know that you and your colleagues have that in your mind, but that does feel like it's an important comment to have on the record today. But I'll just quickly respond to that. It's a really important point. I think if it's not that clear, I think we need to make it absolutely clear that the, there is a very specific core dependency as part of this programme to pick up Doug's point. It, I know it's in there, but it may not be as clear that, that, as it should be. So one of the actions from today, will to make, will need, we need to make clear what that core dependency work is going to contain and how it's going to work. Okay, so this, this is one of the first major consultations that will refer back to the general policy that we had uh, earlier on the agenda. So uh, what we're being asked to do is not to formally approve this in, in, in a sense, but to, uh, uh, for us to have a check, if you like, be satisfied, look, using Graham's words earlier, that it's consistent with an overall policy that we have approved. Uh, so uh, we're really just asked to receive this report as information about how in this area, the two CCGs are intend to go about their, the process. So are we comfortable to uh, accept the report on that basis? Okay, are you okay with that? Thank you very much. So we come to any other business before we come to public questions later on. Is there any other business that anybody wants to raise? No? Thank you very much. So the next meeting uh, of this joint committee, as uh, Andrew, I think, indicated earlier, is uh, in November, on Thursday, the 1st of November, at Morecambe Bay CCG in Lancaster, at Moore Lane Mills in Lancaster, at uh, 1 o'clock, uh, with a pre-meeting for members of the public at 12.30. So uh, we then move now to... Questions from members of the public. Uh, as I have explained previously, we did have this session earlier to try and explain about the process that we're trying to follow, which hopefully you will find better than what we've done in the past. Uh, we uh, will we'll restrict questions to items that are on this agenda, but if there are other items that people want to raise, we will try and find a way to make sure that those matters can be addressed in some other form and some, in some other place. So are there any mem members of the public who wish to ask a question that relates to this agenda? If you are, it would be useful if you say who you are and if you represent somebody who you represent. You don't have to do that, but we will take a note of your question and uh, the response, which of course in any event will be on YouTube very shortly, I think. Okay, would anybody like to ask a question? Uh, there is a microphone uh, just uh, coming along uh, there. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's just a, um, a general question about the last report to do with um, provision of um, um, acute, acute care, care. really. Um, I work for a minority and community mental health team, and I'm just about to start work in the acute um, mental health ward in Chorley, and I realise that you've reduced the number of inpatient beds after closing Burnley down, and I just wondered, um, I appreciate the model, and I appreciate the fact that you have to build up resources to be able to support people to self-manage the care in their, own, in their own home and everything, and um, I just wondered if there was any... Um, just the reasoning behind that really is that is there any other supports that uh, that I'm not aware of that will help to alleviate that reduction in the inpatient because I know it falls on families um, if if, uh, if they can't get an inpatient bed 
and there's a lot of stress with, within community mental health teams to find beds if there isn't any. So I just wondered if there's any other provision where that risk can be uh, reduced or uh, catered <coughs> for, or if there's any support for families if they're in those situations. Dennis, oops, sorry, Dennis. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to defer your question to somebody who knows much more about mental health services than I do, um, because I think the, the context of your question is this changes to the inpatient facilities and what we're going to do to mitigate risks that's caused because of that. Um, I mean, I know we're doing a lot in terms of integrating mental health teams within communities, work on GP practices, etc., and that's one thing, but that's not going to answer your question. Um, I'm not sure if Andrew may be... You, you, so again, I, I, I don't want to guess at an answer when I think colleagues in Lancashire Care Trust would have much more detail to say. I don't know if you're working with them, but, but they would have much more detail to say. Um, there are certainly pressures at the moment in the, in the mental health system, particularly for people with acute illness that need some form of inpatient treatment. Um, CCGs in Lancashire are working with that trust at the moment to, to, to identify a range of actions, some of them more short term, some of them long term, um, as to how we try and reduce some of those pressures. Um, examples, um, people staying in inpatient services for too long, so they're getting blocked at the back of their treatment, the end of their treatment. Now there's been some improvement in that, but equally um, some people ending up in A&E for extended periods that, that need, again, a different pathway, a, a, a smoother pathway. One of the very specific actions that we have begun is a piece of work with another mental health trust. They've come from Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, um, and they're doing a peer review of services in Lancashire and looking at issues like pressure of demand, flow, patient experience and staff experience. That began earlier in September and we were expecting to get some results of that by November time. So that is, uh, I suppose, an example of how the system, commissioners and providers, are trying to work together. But if, if there's something we can talk about more specifically at, at the end of the meeting, um, you might have your own network, but we might try and get you a more precise answer to that question. OK, thank you. Uh, the lady, yes. I've been asked to ask a question about engagement from Mick Morgan who gave his, your, his credentials earlier. So yeah. these aren't my words at the moment. Although I would say, uh, when you mention as few as 2,000 people who, uh, from the public have been engaged, I would imagine that uh, many of those were the same people, time and time again, the same few. This, uh, this is Mick, these are Mick Morgan's words, so I might stumble over them a little bit. Re-engagement. Excellent start to develop the necessary level of public participation. But it's clear that at the highest level, i.e. the board, there is none. Yet the board leads on definition and more so, more so what is eligible for consultation. Repeatedly, the document reinforces the need for public engagement, especially from representative bodies, MPs, councillors, trade unions, trade union councils, community campaigns, community some things or others, I can't read that word. Could it not be considered to have engagement at every level? There's a distinct lack of adequate representation at the necessary levels of decision making and no engagement whatsoever with public lay members and public representative bodies in our experience. Um, we, I'm a member of the Chorley's A&E campaign and we did uh, publicised the last Our Health, Our Care meeting, which meant that we had a better turnout. Do you have a budget for uh, public... You know, I never see anything in the local newspaper. I've never seen a leaflet. I mean, I, I get texts all the time about my flu jab. Um, could we not have texts to, from the GP surgeries in the same way to announce these meetings? And, and get the public engaged uh, at a higher level. Would the layperson for our CCG uh, feel like attending some of our meetings to keep us informed? He must be very well informed of what's going on and it we would like to perhaps see him at some of our meetings. Thank you. Well, it seems that there's a general point that maybe Gary might want to deal with about the consultation that we've just uh, agreed. There might be something more specific Dennis or Geoffrey wants to uh, respond to as well. So. Gary, do you want to? Um, yes, so, so 
um, regarding resources, um, we have put some money aside um, to be able to um, develop our ICS level, um, uh, uh, this level, Lancashire and South Cumbria level um, uh, comms and engagement team. Um, but I think, I don't, don't, don't know where Neil is, Neil's standing over there. Um, we're also looking at the way in which we can link more closely with the local engagement teams and between a central team and the local teams do a much better job than we're able to do now. So um, within the budget, um, we've identified um, um, a million pounds to be able to do this better than we have done in the past. So um, part of that money um, will be used um, and is, is being used this year to supplement the resources um, that uh, the CCGs in um, central Lancashire have devoted to, to this project. So from now onwards, um, using the document that we've discussed today and our expectations about the way in which we want to do things, um, we, would, uh, uh, we would hope that we would start seeing um, a difference in the way that things are being done. Um, and the resources are being devoted to doing that because it is, um, it is a, a major priority for us. And um, um, Mitchell here um, works for um, um, an organisation whose specialism is advising public bodies about how to use the most modern techniques to reach the public. Um, and that's something we, we want to fund to make sure we, we do it properly. So uh, we're gearing ourselves up to be able to make sure that um, a good level of consultation is achieved um, and the resources are being devoted to do that. Sorry. The world besides uh, ageing population complex needs should always have yeah, access to technology. Just like that. Yeah, uh, just like you know, that. What, first, yeah. Is there anything wrong with a leaflet or a publicity in the local newspapers, which, of which I've seen none? Um, no, that's, that's useful feedback for us to take on board. Um, as Gary said, you know, there's, there's resource um, being put towards this to make sure that there's a, um, the right involvement um, activities and materials used. And I completely agree in terms of having a mixture of hard copy and, and online technology used. Uh, there needs to be a mix of that. Um, and yeah, I, I agree in, in that respect. So yeah, happy uh, to take on board. And, and can it be about, um, Okay, well, perhaps uh, the Geoffrey might want to respond and Dennis, and then Amanda wants to make a more general point. Yeah, yeah a couple of things, actually. I suppose one is to actually outline, I suppose, what is my role as a member at the CCG. I think the one thing I would like to say is I really welcome the work of the Chorley A&E campaign group um, in terms of uh, the publicity that they do act, and activizing, <coughs> activizing people to get involved. Um, from a CCG point of view, clearly, I think one of the things we constantly do is always ask uh, after our events, how could we do things better? I think there's going to be some clear debates uh, in terms of how we go forward with uh, consultation events. Uh, or sorry, engagement, about how we do better to, in fact, get the message out. And there's a clear issue there that we could do better, I think. In terms of um, my attendance at a campaign group, um, whilst in one sense I'm happy to come along, I'm not sure really I'm the person that you want to listen to. Um, my role at the CCG as a lay member is actually to ensure that we've got our processes right. Um, the kind of things you're really interested, I would have thought, is the clinical case for what we're proposing, thinking about, uh, engaging on. I'm not the person to do that. As Dennis has said, um, you know, it's not, in a sense, officers or lay people that you want to listen to. It's actually want to, it's the clinicians that you want to hear from because they know what the clinical case that they're presenting. But other than that, we're still looking at the ways in which we can engage. Uh, Amanda. Thanks. So um, Jeff's picked up some of the things I was going to say, but I think it's worth, as, as far as the decision-making and lay involvement in that, I think there's at least seven or eight members of this committee sat around the table who are lay members specifically here to bring that lay public perspective to the decision-making to ensure that 
we have that point. Some of them have local responsibilities within CCGs around public engagement. Uh, if there are ways we could do that better, then we are really keen to hear your feedback on that. Um, if there are ways we can communicate better, and what we really need is a mix. There are, you know, there are different ways of communicating. All of them have their cons as well as their pros. So lot, it's, you wouldn't believe how few people read local newspapers, for example. But there are some people who just do that and don't look at social media. And so we have to cover all of those angles. And then we have to use resources effectively. It costs thousands and thousands of pounds to put information in local papers. And so we do talk to the local press sometimes, but we don't want to spend thousands on adverts if there are other ways we can get the message out to people, because I'm sure you equally wouldn't want us using um, NHS and local authority research, uh, resource uh, in the le not in the most effective way. So I think so it's, Adam it's wants covering all those options. Adam, really. Adam, just one moment. Adam wants to comment, and then we'll take perhaps one more public question. Adam. I just want to raise the, uh, the, the specific question around, uh, as a GP uh, and somebody who is a GP partner, w uh, you mentioned sending a text message for public meetings. Uh, now, unfortunately, <laughs> when patients sign up for text messaging services with their general practice, um, in any case, they only consent to have information that is directly related to their care. Uh, as you'll be aware, there was a GDPR uh, regulation come into effect from the 24th of May this year. GDPR? Yes, um, whereby we have to be very careful. GDPR? Uh, General Data Protection Regulation, okay. uh, whereby we have to be very careful with how we use anybody's data. And that applies to any company, including Sky and BT, perhaps even. Um, so if we were found to be in breach of that by sending out um, text messages soliciting sort of attendance at various public events, as important as they may be to general public, patients might object to that. So that would never be an, um, a, 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 an option for, for us to be able to do, unfortunately. I, I never even saw uh, oh, well, I'm just answering the question with regards to why you're not seeing text messages uh, other than the flu jabs. So we've time for one more question. The lady said... Uh, one of the things that I'm a vice chair on the uh, patient voice committee we have at the CCG, um, which meets um, and reports to the governing body where we scrutinize the level of engagement that is constantly ongoing with the staff at the CCG about the groups that they're meeting with, discussing with. So th there's very comprehensive data that we've got on that. Okay, so we've time for perhaps one more question. Would somebody else like to ask a question for members of the public? I would like to ask regarding the policies on commissioning. I was recently at the um, NHS England regarding the 17 uh, elective surgeries that were that are due to that are under consultation. Well, the consultation has just finished uh, to be removed. Um, pretty much like your policies here on commissioning. Some of those are listed in yours, others, um, uh, others are listed in phase two, which is due to come out later. Um, now, I did ask a question there and I didn't get an answer. So I was wondering if I could have, uh, if, if you were able to give that answer, especially considering this gentleman, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name. I know you're a doctor. Don't, I can't see your, your name thing from here. Thank you. <laughs> um, regarding um, the accountability, there was a lot of talk about Obviously, when you're following the nice guidelines that patients don't like it, and the GP then is put under pressure, therefore, let's remove this option, which we were told that it's not just clinically based, this is a financial based option, which, was, which we were told by the clinicians at the NHS England consultation. It is a financial policy, not only cl uh, clinical. So, given that, when that decision on whether the funding is going to be given to any, any one in particular patient for these surgeries or these um, treatments, who is actually going to be responsible when that goes wrong? Is it going to be that financial body or is it going to be the, the GP who actually has the clinical knowledge? Okay, well this is our, our final question from members of the public and uh, Dr Doyle will answer. 
Um, so the process you're referring to, which is very similar to the process we've been discussing earlier today, is uh, a process that's being run nationally by NHS England around what they're calling evidence ba value-based interventions. So it's um, it's surgical interventions largely that we make. Um, for some of those, the group, and I don't want to go into detail, there's a whole list of things. For a small number of those, those are things that are proposed to not be commissioned because there is now clear evidence gathered over time that the risk associated with those interventions is greater than the benefit associated. So they are clinically um, things that have risk associated and no evidence of benefit. So that's one group, and that's fairly clear cut. Yeah, not, okay. Not, so, so there are two groups. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there is a small number of interventions, as there were with the medicines one that was done first, where the risk outweighs the benefit. And then there are a group, a bigger group, for which the um, rationale for some of the commissioning decisions takes into account affordability. So it takes money into account. Um, and this is back to what we were saying before. We do not have unlimited resource in the NHS, and therefore we have to prioritise what we spend to get the greatest benefit for the population as a whole. We have to, uh, we can only spend money we've got, and we haven't got enough resource to do everything that everybody would like us to do in every case. And so we have to prioritise. And one of the ways in which we prioritise is looking at those interventions for which there is evidence of only limited or little clinical benefit for patients and what this process is saying is that we will not prioritize for spending our money things in which there is very limited evidence of benefit to people so that we can then prioritize things for which there is clear evidence and that's back to the discussion we had before there's really clear evidence of benefit for some patients of um, flash glucose monitoring uh, for some diabetic patients Unless we don't spend as much on things of which there isn't much evidence, we can't invest in new treatments and technologies which patients will benefit from. So this is a continuous process of how much have we got and what's the best we can possibly do with that budget for our population as a whole. And so some things are being deprioritized um, because the benefit is limited and the cost needs to be reinvested in other drugs and treatments. So if, if and then there's a detrimental effect to the patient, who is accountable? The GP who actually put forward okay. that commissioning group. No, I, I know they, what you're asking. They think clinically this person now needs this treatment, or is the person who's accountable for that the person who denies that care? So, accountable for the commissioning decisions about what commission, what is funded and commissioned, is the commissioning body, which is usually the CCG accountable for individual clinical care is the individual clinician who gave that clinical care. So if the issue that you raise was, for example, due to a commissioning decision, something not being funded, then the accountability would lie with the commissioning body, which is CCG. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, that, that ends the uh, meeting. Uh, thank you to college who, colleagues who've attended today and thank you to members of the uh, public. Uh, I hope you've found the arrangements more suitable than has previously been the case. If there are improvements we could make, please let us know. And if there are things that you didn't think you could ask today and you want to ask we get more information perhaps because they're more detailed, if you uh, speak to Neil, who I think is about, or one of, yeah, Neil, who's here, we can make a note of those and see that they're dealt with. So uh, that's the end of the meeting, and thanks very much for everybody's attendance. Thank you.